the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So there's always a risk when uh, you've fallen in love with a book and they make it into a movie that you'll go to see the movie and leave disappointed. It's actually more than a risk, it's a probability. Uh, but The Life of Pi got great reviews as a movie, so I was excited to go see it. Uh, but the part that really grabbed me from the very beginning uh, in the book was missing from the movie, and that's the, uh, the part of uh, the main character, Pi, or uh, Pi scene, uh, falling in love with God. And he does so in kind of a strange way. Uh, he first goes and he visits a Catholic priest, and, uh, and he visits him regularly. One day a week he ends up going there and, and learning uh, from this priest all of the tenets of Christianity, uh, and he falls in love with this God that he discovers uh, in, in, in Christianity. Um, and then, uh, maybe on Thursday, uh, it turns out that he goes to the Hindu priest and he learns all about Hinduism and, um, and he becomes a prized uh, student of, of Hinduism, uh, one that the Hindu priest takes tremendous pride, uh, pride in and, uh, uh, and sees a future for him in the, in the Hindu uh, faith. Uh, and then maybe on Monday it is that he goes and he goes to visit the uh, Iman uh, uh, over at the mosque uh, and he is the star student uh, of Islam. Uh, he is learning every tenet. Uh, and the imam is so proud of them. Um, in fact, there's a, a humorous exchange between these religious leaders in their community uh, about this young student that they are so proud of uh, that they are sure is going to be the next big leader in their uh, faith community until they realize they're talking about the same person. Um, but it's important in his life's journey uh, that he has this robust understanding of who God is. Uh, and he doesn't see them as incongruent with one another, uh, but part of a different way of understanding the same uh, true God. Uh, and this becomes incredibly uh, important as his adventure continues. And to not ruin too much of the plot, but this is at the beginning, and if you haven't read or seen it in the first 10 years, uh, I feel like I'm free to uh, uh, burst your bubble a bit. Um, <laughs> So they're moving their zoo from India, I believe, to the United States. Um, and uh, in the process, uh, there's a big uh, a, a boat wreck, uh, and all of the animals are on the boat, and, um, and uh, uh, Pi and, and some others uh, end up on uh, an, a, an escape boat, um, a life raft, uh, and the adventure is how he survives uh, on this raft. Uh, and he calls upon the different aspects of God that he has learned from these, uh, these faith leaders, from these different faith communities. Uh, and it is the uh, ability to understand God so robustly uh, that allows him uh, to, to channel uh, and find strength uh, and conviction and faith uh, and assurance uh, in this uh, pretty uh, incredible uh, place that he finds himself. Uh, and I think that that's uh, one of the important things that we do uh, as people of faith is we learn as much as we can who it is uh, that drew us here today. Who is it that uh, is our God that draws us to church, that, that makes us people of faith, uh, that made us in the first place? Who is our God? It's an important question. So no one's ever called me their prized pupil, but I, I had a similar feeling uh, that Pi might have had um, when I was uh, probably 17 uh, years old. I was uh, spending the summer taking care of my grandmother. I was up in Vermont, um, and my pattern was, because I was about the only one my age there, uh, actually I was about the only one within 60 years of my age, um, I would kind of wander from camp to camp or from cottage to cottage to visit uh, my relatives, uh, my great aunts, um, and... Uh, there was probably more religious or, or denominations uh, uh, represented in our little camp than, than most of Vermont as a state. Uh, we uh, had my uh, Christian scientist uh, great aunt. I go visit her. Uh, we would play cards. Uh, and I could see her in absolute incredible pain. She was into her 90s, uh, but she wouldn't take the slightest pain uh, reliever because she believed that all that she needed uh, was God and that God would relieve her of all the pain uh, uh, of the world and that she had no uh, need of modern medicine. She was that convicted uh, that God was that intimately involved in every aspect of her life uh, that, that God would intervene in her pain. Uh, uh, you know, I, and I took that from her, that, that, that belief that God is so invested in her 
Um, and as much as I believe in modern medicine, as much as I didn't quite go to the same place that she did, I took that incredible belief that God is actively at work in her life, in her body. Um, and, and, and that was one of the enduring truths that, uh, that she left me with. And then I'd go to my uh, uh, other great aunt, uh, and she was a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, my grandfather had, uh, had been very clear that, that, that she wasn't uh, to proselytize to family members, but... Uh, I think it was because she liked me the most, uh, but she would always sort of corner me. She knew I was interested in religion, and uh, becoming a Jehovah's Witness uh, was life-saving for her. She uh, came from an abusive marriage, uh, and there were some truths and, 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 and some clarity uh, in that tradition uh, that gave her a sense of belonging, that gave her a sense of truth, uh, that allowed her to put together these pieces, um, and gave her a hope that there was more. Uh, she was uh, so... Uh, tied to that hope that she had her bags packed. Uh, and it was her deepest hope that the people that she loved most, most uh, would believe her so that they could be uh, there ready by the front door when God came. Uh, and from her, I took the importance of believing in something, of having a deep faith, uh, also the importance of anticipating God, what it is to anticipate God. I didn't become a Jehovah's Witness, or I wouldn't be here today, um, uh, but I did appreciate a good bit of what she had to teach me. And then uh, I had this other aunt who, uh, who seemed to switch re uh, uh, denominations quite frequently. Uh, and I remember uh, talking to her, and it was uh, right at the very, very end of her mother's life. And I remember how distressed she was um, uh, that, um, and this was during her, uh, her, her more evangelical uh, uh, season in her life, and uh, she was so distressed that she didn't believe that her mother had accepted Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior. And she was so concerned uh, about um, her, her mother's eternal salvation, and, uh, and that was almost a daily struggle with her to go in and just ask her mom, please, just accept it. Just accept uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and all will be okay. Uh, in fact, even... Uh, after uh, her mother passed, and I'm not quite sure what the eth medical ethics are in this, uh, but uh, she asked the doctor, uh, please, um, so was there any chance that right before she died that she accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior? And the, uh, the doctor said, I believe, I believe she did. I think I did. He's, uh, it helped her find some peace. Um, and I, I didn't necessarily subscribe to that, but it made me ask questions. Who is the God that I believe in? Is it a God that, uh, that is immediately transformed uh, or, uh, or shifts his way of understanding or, 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 or investing in us uh, by our last second proclamation that this is the, uh, the Lord and Savior? Or is it a God who is all loving and all powerful uh, and has been invested in us before we were ever even conceived uh, and is always drawing us home, always relentlessly pursuing us? Uh, the God that we find in that story of the prodigal, uh, the God, the Father, who gives us the freedom uh, uh, to go out and make mistakes and to live the life that we've been, uh, we've been uh, given, uh, but always is, is relentlessly hoping we come home uh, and, and working towards, uh, towards redemption uh, and renewal. Uh, and, uh, and as I thought about that, I also thought about last Sunday's reading. You remember this, the, the, the parable of the talents that we talked about last week and the, uh, the one who gets... Um, uh, uh, the five talents, and he multiplies them by five, and he gets ten talents, and the one who has three, or multiplies them by two, I'm better at math than that, uh, the one who had three and doubles that and gets six, uh, and then the one with one talent. Uh, and remember the line before he tells what happens? He says, I knew you were a harsh God who reaped what you did not sow. And so I buried the treasure and did nothing with my life. I lived in fear that anything I did wrong uh, would be punishable. So I did nothing with my life but buried it, preserved it, and buried it. How he understood God defined how he lived his life. He understood God as harsh and reaping what he did not sow, and so he did nothing with the abundance that he'd been given. I think, I mean, most important question for us is not, do we believe in God? It's who is the God that we believe in and how does that affect our lives? Do we believe in an uh, interventionist God uh, that is playing uh, um, like a chess game, that, uh, that every act of our lives is predetermined by God, that is uh, always 
always uh, working a larger plan than we can see or imagine. Uh, I think there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of truth in that. I also think that, that uh, we have to understand that uh, in terms of what does that mean when, when things are going horribly, uh, when things that are inexplicable are happening in our lives. Um, does that mean that we just weren't part of God's ultimate plan or that we can't see uh, far enough away? Either way, that can be heartbreaking. As a child, that's more how I thought about God. As an adult, as a parent, I realized it takes infinite more, infinitely more love uh, to stand there hovering over somebody that I love, uh, somebody that I'm invested in uh, more than life itself, and to allow them to make mistakes, to allow them to do things that I wouldn't have done, to allow them to get hurt and not scoop them up right away and, and, and fix their scraped knee, uh, but to let them fail and to let them wander away, uh, but to always be there um, to, to, to do everything in my power uh, to reconcile, uh, to, uh, to heal, uh, uh, to restore. Uh, and, and I've understood God far more in terms of the, the God of the prodigal uh, than in the, uh, the God that, uh, that is continuously playing all of us like chess pieces. Uh, but however we understand that affects how we live our lives. If we believe that God is the God who made all of us in God's own image, then it affects how we care for one another. And the difficulty that we have uh, with any person uh, is something that our Christian identity has to overcome. And that's a struggle for all of us, certainly for me. Uh, if I truly believe that, uh, that God is in uh, the person who thinks as differently as I possibly could, uh, if I believe that uh, we are all made in the image of God, that God is in the hungry uh, and the thirsty and the imprisoned, uh, and uh, um, you name it, the person that challenges you the most, uh, and that God makes us out of love, uh, and that God's image is in that person, uh, and that God is a relational God, always calling us into restoration, always calling us into reconciliation, uh, then I cannot ignore that. Uh, I, that must always gnaw on me and be part of my identity as part of the body of Christ. This is the last Sunday of the church year. This is Christ the King Sunday. And I think the call for each of us, as we've been through all of those stories, uh, all of those seasons in the church year, is to ask ourselves, who is the God that drew us here this morning? Who is the God that we claim by saying we are part of the body of Christ, that we are Christian? And how does that identity, how does that God shape who we are, who we are as people, who we are as kingdom builders, who we are as followers of that king, our God? Amen.